Talking Reds. It's me, Rob Gottman. I'm at the wheel. Neil's in, Neil's in the passenger seat. It's a, it's a rare reverse of juxtaposition. But we are where we are. Um, we've, got a, we've got a packed show to get through. Oh, someone's trying to call me while I'm actually doing the show. I'll just turn this off and refer to my notes instead and be seamlessly professional about it. Um, there was a you've got a lot of notes. I mean, I want to say this, Philip. The reason why you've got your phone out, it's not because you've not got... It's not be, you're not being lazy or anything like that. You have a lot of notes. You're about to go through a full technical report with me. Yes, but the get along, strap yourselves in. <laughs> This is the uh, this is this is manna from heaven for, for the likes of Neil. Uh, it's UA, well, UEFA technical report for the Champions League a, for the eighteen nineteen yep. season, the one where we reign supreme in. Uh, UEFA, let's let's keep it. We can't stress this enough, can we? UEFA's panel of te of technical observers includes two former Blues managers. Fucking hell. I think it was uh, Moisey's on it, and who else was on it from Everton? But Gareth Southgate and Michael. I feel like Neal. Walter Smith. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Like I don't know. Walter, I mean, Walter may not even be well. He may have passed away. I don't think he has. But I feel like this is the sort of gig Walter Smith gets. Oh, could be Martinez. It's Martinez. It's Martinez. It's Martinez. It's Martinez. Current manager of the Belgium national team. So there is some diversity going on here beyond Everton. Um, <laughs> It'd be great if we've got all of Everton's former managers just to discuss Liverpool's Champions League when that feels like a show. The future is blue. <laughs> it's being defined. Um, they came up with a number of conclusions, which are all all really quite interesting. The primary one was that, although this seems a bit of a broad conclusion, tactical flexibility overrides a rigid philosophy they decided. Uh, so, uh, how are you interpreting that? Well, I think that this is really interesting. There was, I did some conversations with Rory Smith uh, last season, as I like to do sometimes on the weekend or sometimes on Midnight Caller, mm -hmm. and one of the things that me and Rory would talk about was that the systems managers, and you'd put Klopp in as a systems manager, but the systems managers hadn't had it all their own way in the Champions League, not least because of Real Madrid's dominance. And Real Madrid, you know, what, what's Zidane's system? Even now, that's actually a difficult question to answer. He has really good footballers and he gets them playing really good football, but that's not the same as being able mm. to say, you know, look at uh, 10 seconds of a side and no, that's Guardiola. Look at 10 seconds of a side and no, that's Klopp or that's Pochettino. Yeah. And, and I think that Liverpool last season genuinely do ever so slightly shift away not for, it depends on how you sort of think of the system if you know what I mean that yeah. whether or that the philosophy doesn't change I don't think too much but the idea that there's quite a set system, systemic approach I think does change and I think Liverpool do move away from it and if we remember sort of early last season in the same way that this season's currently being dominated with conversations about where's the line hmm. how high's the line last season for the first 8, eight 10 15 games was a Liverpool pressing less and that was all the chat, a Liverpool pressing less. More conservative, a bit more defensive. And the answer, I think, over the course of the season is managed to be, as all good answers are, both yes and no. Liverpool were pick, arguably picking their moments better than they ever had before, and in those moments playing more aggressively. But in terms of the idea that there was, in inverted commas, and the manager doesn't like it, heavy metal football happening, well, that had sort of disappeared. And I think that's the... That's what that's driving at there. The, you know, it wasn't that Liverpool played 4-3-3 every single game. It wasn't even that Liverpool played 4-3-3 from the outsets of games and stuck with it. Even in the final, we actually finished. When Origi scores, we've gone 4-4-1-1. And we saw that domestically last season, but you then sort of, it Porto away. Half-time, he makes the sub, he brings Firmino on. And he, he basically just goes 4-4-1-1, Porto away, because basically everyone was having to run low until we were getting overwhelmed in wide areas. Yeah. So I think that's what that's referring to, that Liverpool didn't just sort of play 4-3-3 and it wasn't, it was Endlessly, what we now associate as Jurgen Klopp. I think it's saying no, Liverpool picked the moments a little bit more, weren't as rigid tactically, weren't as you know where everybody's going to be. It wasn't like that. And I think that's what it's driving at. Yeah, UEFA concluded that was something, I, I might be paraphrasing wrongly, but something like passive control by Liverpool. And the final was an example of it. And you can see in, uh, in Liverpool's possession stats, which at first surprised until you think about it, Liverpool are very, very rigidly throughout the season, 50% in the possession stats. Yeah. Almost game in, game out. You can look at that in several ways. I wonder, I wonder how you'd interpret it. My first, my first thought is that Liverpool were a team who weren't behind much in football matches last season. And if you're not behind in football matches, a lot of the time it means your possession stats don't end up great because you sort of seed the last third of game, games to team to come at you. You're not... Well, I'd say... To, Two types of teams, really. Teams like City, who try and see out games with the ball. Yep. Teams like Liverpool, I think, are less inclined to see out a game with the ball. That might explain that. 
Yeah, I think to an extent, I think that's definitely there. And I think if you actually go through the games, I think that's an excellent observation. Paris Saint-Germain away is arguably the only game until Barcelona yeah. where we find ourselves behind it, either in the course of the game or in the course of the tie. Um, Belgrade is this odd little exception and we probably have 60, 65, maybe even 70% possession against Belgrade, exactly. if I remember rightly. Whereas in the other games, I think we were a little happier to see that possession off the basis of the fact that we, we we backed ourselves to keep our shape, to defend responsibly, but also knew that we could break. And I think that that's something which you've seen from this Liverpool side this season domestically so far as well. You know, I think that the we were happy at times at the weekend just gone. You know, we don't absolutely dominate the ball at Burnley and we don't really feel the need to. Yeah. You can almost do your thing for a little period here and we're just going to keep repelling it. And I think that that's something which, you know, I think that's a sign of maturity. And again, this is back to the idea that Liverpool are maybe a little bit less committed to a certain style and a certain approach. But I'll say again, the sort of the philosophy behind it remains remains pretty consistent. And it's stark in core moments when we feel as though you're vulnerable or when we feel as though we suddenly have a physical advantage or a territorial advantage, we're absolutely ruthless and we're going to swarm you. And I think that the thing about the Liverpool side last season is it's shit, even in a game, you watch Barcelona at home back hmm. and before the game and I was doing loads of stuff where I was saying 1-0 on 70 is fine. 1-0 yeah. on 70 is fine. And that's a really easy thing for someone like me and you to say. It's different when you're in the ground as a supporter and it's obviously different again when you're in the ground as a player. 1-0 yeah. on 70 doesn't feel fine. But they really embodied that through that game. They get 1-0 up really, really early and they actually... You know, you watch the full 90 back and the creating and they're, they're eager, but they're not irresponsible really, with one exception just as we get into the half time. They're not throwing unbelievable numbers forward. They still feel as though there's loads of time to score these goals that we need. And then, then they go two and then they go three straight away. And then Liverpool sides in the past, think about, you know, the, the only time at Istanbul in 05 when Liverpool looked like they could win the game win the game mm. was the five minutes after they went 3-3 when they have two or three more aggressive sort of thrusts forward and then it's yeah. like they're exhausted and they drop not the Liverpool side against Barcelona it goes 3-3 and they almost go right we're just going to keep you back at arm's length now for a bit and Barcelona get two or three half chances because Liverpool have almost gone nowhere resting back into the game now and we're going to come at you again it's because if we digress to that game that game was the classic example of how managers persuaded a team that are down and out that the only thing they have to worry about is scoring the next goal yeah I remember reading an, an Alex Ferguson biog thing from years ago, and he talked about his time, I think, as a Rangers or a Hearts player, wherever he played as a, as a, as a club footballer. And he said they were 5-0 they were down at half-time, and everyone was demoralised in the dressing room. The manager just, just said to them, Alex, just score the next goal. Just make that your job for the half. Get a goal. And, you know, they got, they got two or three, and it was a job well done. And I think that's what happens that night. They were only ever worried about the next goal, which is an extension of what you're saying. Um, but the other thing that UEFA identified about Liverpool in particular, and what, what they call tactical flexibility, is actually a little bit more basic, actually, than, than analysing systems. They said Liverpool scored a shitload of goals from set pieces. Yeah. And I, I think we acknowledge this without really understanding its importance. I think it was the, why Liverpool became a truly, and I'm going to use the word, a great side in 2001 under Gerard Houllier in winning the treble that year. Because it was a side that did have a range of ways of playing. It could be very compact, it could, it could be very offensive when it wanted to be, but mainly it had a goal in it from a set piece. It had three or four who could deliver and three or four who could finish. And I think we underrate that and I think it's been a massive adaptation in Klopp's game. I agree with that, I think it's really fair, Rob, and I think that, I think that comes back to, you know, there's, there's reasons, reasons why Matip's ended up in this side. Yeah. But I think one of those reasons is that you've suddenly got one lad who's six foot six, maybe even six foot seven. I am hugely skeptical of football's published heights, and I've seen Virgil van Dijk, mm. and I've seen him stood next to Jamie Carragher, mm. and I'm I'm quite convinced that Virgil is actually bigger than his published height, unlike wrestlers. Um, and I think Matip is six five uh, yeah. minimum. And I think that in the most basic way, all of a sudden you've got those two factors in there. Firmino is of a certain size. Uh, Fabinho is signed for no accident. Yeah, uh, his physicality. I think. Exactly, uh, Fabinho as well in there. And then you begin to throw in, you know, the fact that Mane really does rise in the penalty area. We've seen that enough times, and we actually get to the point where, and I've seen this with Liverpool sides on the other end of it, you become difficult to mark. Mm. There's the uh, in 08 09 Chelsea scored two goals uh, in the, in the Champions League quarter final when they come to Anfield. Yeah. Um, and two of those goals are scored by Ivanovic. Yeah. And Ivanovic mm. is being marked by Alonso. 
And you can say, or oh, he's in Alonso zone, it was the zonal uh, man-to-man mix that Benitez mm. used to do, and it was perfectly fine. And you can say, well, what's he doing putting Alonso on on on, um, on that footballer? Yeah. And you get to the point with it where you're like, well, hang on, someone's got to be on John Terry. Someone's got to be on Drogba. Someone's got to be... And you just get to the point that there's there's, there's a mismatch somewhere. That once, if, 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 if you occupy their biggest lads and you've then got one more, two more, mm. then all of a sudden it is, you are vulnerable from it and then you're vulnerable from cleverness around it, you're vulnerable from adaptations. And I think it's really, really important. And I, it, for me, is something which... Well, we see the goal this season from Joel Matip against Arsenal. Does Clive, that... How many are on Virgil van Dijk at that corner? It's ridiculous. Exactly. I mean, he's screaming for a penalty because about four of them are absolutely trying to pull him down. Meanwhile, there's Joel. Yeah, so, you know, if in that instance, the Chelsea instance that I use, if the right back is six foot two yeah. and an absolute unit in the air, then you just get to the point where you're like, well, we can't mark everybody. We, no. can't, put, we can't put, you know, think about the Liverpool, that Liverpool side, then Skirtle and Carrick on everybody. Someone ends up being marked by Alonso. And yeah. you follow that through for us now, and I think that's where we are at the minute. And you're right to say that people are rightly terrified of Virgil, and that's going to create space elsewhere. Now, listen, you don't score that many from headers. At times last season, we were frustrated with Matip from set pieces, but his expected goals to goals was perfectly reasonable mm. when you look it up, because we think every single corner, when you're in the moment, when you're living life, you feel as though it's it's about to lead to something. For me, people talk at the minute, they say things quite casually like, oh, it's how this Liverpool side can improve. Oh, how this Liverpool side can improve is something else in centre mid. Well, you say that, but what's the knock-on effect? Et cetera, et cetera. But I'll tell you, another way this Liverpool side could improve is getting someone who's an identified threat on the pitch from 20 to 25 yards from three free kicks around the areas. I think Trent is good. I think he's tidy, but I think he's not, you know, he's not peak here to Gary McAllister. Um, I think he may that, be one day, but not he may yet. be one day, but not, not, not seemingly not right now. But you know what he did harness last season, second phase set pieces, and this is where Robertson and I think Trent actually quietly get most of their assists from. Yep. Which is we allowed the first ball to be headed clear if necessary, badly because they were under pressure and from then, Virgil. And the second ball would come out, and then the forwards basically had a very, very fast ball well, coming that's, out. That, that's the Origi goal in the final. It is the Origi goal. The Origi goal in the final, final is yes. that phase of play. There's, yes. Virgil's involved somewhere, he just sort of half keeps it alive. It drops towards Matip. Matip does the smart thing and finds. And what's the most interesting thing about the Origi goal in the final is actually Origi. And I don't think it's just accident. I think it's, it may well be that it's being coached in, ends up in a ton of space. Hmm. And it's almost as if when this happens, you go here. Well, you've got an be... overload, haven't you? Exactly. Especially if a team's trying to come out. See, what happens if they win the first ball, they're trying to come out, their instincts are on the front foot. Meanwhile, you stay knowing you... if you're sharp on the second ball. Uh, and that's a key thing that was in the UEFA technical report they noticed. The average time for a goal to be scored, they're saying, is 12 and a half seconds across the Champions League. That's from regain of possession to ball and net. Liverpool, oh, I'm going to grab the stat, it's about half, about six and a half seconds. What does that tell you? tells me that Liverpool are regaining the ball higher up the pitch. They must be, okay, they might be moving it quicker as well, but to be that much quicker about it. Just on that, that this is back to my, and this, this is a sort of like a three or four year rant of mine, and it will still happen, it'll happen at some point this season. I think I've actually said it at one point this season. Just take him out. Just take him out, just tackle him and take him out, just wallop him. On the counter? Uh, on no, when, when the opposition has the ball sometimes. And if you look at the way Henderson in particular, but now Fabinho, who is better at it than Henderson, but Henderson was trying to do and still does try to do, Liverpool want to win the ball in a way that means they've got control of the ball. Yeah. And what that means is sometimes, in an old style sentiment sense, you could just wallop them and you take them out, the mm. ball goes out for a throw, the player's on the deck, we all go, way, and everyone lives the best life. Yeah. Whereas what Liverpool actually want to do is, is they want to come away with the ball under control and Fabinho is brilliant to tackle in a way that keeps the ball under Liverpool control whether for himself or for someone else and that's what you've seen Henderson try and do and there's been numbers of games where you've been in Anfield and you've, you've in the moment you've wished the, the player whether it's Henderson whether it's Milner whether it's Wijnaldum whether it's Fabinho whether it's Emre Chan, you've wished that they would just wallop they just clean someone out because it was there to be won is what you'd say because yeah. often if you take this gamble and you try to win it so you come away with it you're more likely to not win it and the opposition come away with it or you're more likely to look a bit soft and then the crowd's going ah oh, you shit house or something like that whereas the brave thing to do mm. is to try to win it so that you're able to recycle it fast and move forward and I think Liverpool's tackling as, as I think that, and I think that's what this stat says to it in a sense. Liverpool's ball recovery to having the ball in an area where they can really do something with it, time is phenomenal. It's the best I've ever seen. Mm. Liverpool get the ball back and the ball is somewhere they can do something with it. And yeah. by do something, I mean stick it in the net. I don't mean anything else. I mean create a really good opportunity. And I think that's what you see all the time. And that's what 
when we do, and I, as I say, it's happened to me this season, and I think it's a game state thing. If you're one nil up, I'm less. I've got less time for the idea to try and nick it cleanly and come out. At times, I do just want to see you take everything and go from there and pick up the bits. But I think that's what this Liverpool midfield is really good at. It's what Mane's good at. It's what Firmino's good at. You see Salah do it at, in key areas as well. You see the fullbacks do it. They love to nick it in a way which means that Liverpool, either the player themselves or Liverpool are now on the front foot. But that's one of the hardest things to do in football. And I think what you'll see more and more of is sides like Burnley, where they're not that bothered about how how they're attacking Liverpool, as long as they're losing the ball in a way that doesn't mean they can be counted on. And I think that's the next thing that we're going to have to deal with. We talk at the minute about people trying to get at our high line. I think we're going to see more and more sides have the idea of, you're going to lose it to Liverpool, lose it smart, don't lose it stupid. Yeah, and I think that one of the ways Liverpool gain the ball back efficiently is they hunt in packs. Yep. So it's not one man tackling. You one one next to the side, and another one sweeps the ball away, suddenly Liverpool are on. Yeah, exactly. And that, that's the key thing. Of course, teams try to get around that with a big pass over the top. Helps yep. to have lads who can deal with it coming in hard and fast. We've covered most of the bases I want to cover. Do we want to touch Dejan Lovren? I think the transfer window is all but slammed shut in you. It has slammed shut. And we still have... Degsy Lovren with us. He's making the right noises about how yep. he'd have liked to have got more game time, but he's happy to stay in battle for his place. Sounds like he's being the pro we always thought he was. Yeah, I think that that's the case. I think that there's an issue. Uh, there was an issue all the way through with Lovren, which was there was the idea that Liverpool had a valuation and that clubs across the continent had what they were willing to pay for him, and those two things weren't going to touch. Mm. Uh, so Liverpool either had to come down and take a lower fee if they wanted to let him go, uh, or those clubs w weren't prepared to move beyond a certain point, and I'd say understandably so, yeah. given his fitness record over the last couple of seasons and his age um, but the noises he's made don't all feel similar to the noises players have made in the past the manager came he spoke to me he said I'd be important but if I really wanted to move he'd let me move the window closes the manager comes and speaks to him and says you've got a role to play here and Liverpool, there's a handful for whom January is going to be interesting I think there's more than a handful I think that that might change a few because I think that we've seen in the past I think that a lot of footballers are going to get a lot of games from Newcastle at home through until January. That's and true. then it wouldn't surprise me if by the end of January, there's the fewer and fewer of them are going to be involved. I think Liverpool will settle back to the shape that we see regularly, the 4 3 3, and the core squad will be down to 16 17, as opposed to where I think it may be for this little run, which is 22 23. So some of them could be like Keanu Hoover. It wouldn't surprise me come Christmas, we're talking about him having played somewhere between five and ten games, maybe at least got on the bench for some. Uh, but then come the second half of the season we'll be nowhere to be seen so do we want to send him out on loan I think Lovren in January completely agree with you but I do think that you know he does have a role to play and if Liverpool lift something up this season in exactly the same way that this was the case for a few of them last season I was, I was thinking about this the other day you know I I still think a lot about the celebrations I saw in the ground after Madrid from, from the supporters but also the players and looking at for instance how overjoyed Jadon Shaqiri is doesn't get on the final, never yeah. looks like getting on it, but he played against Barcelona. They don't win that without him. And he gets to feel like that, and he gets to have that moment. Uh, Dejan Lovren was delighted, doesn't get on in the final. Daniel Sturridge knew he'd scored in that competition. So they, they've all got a role to play, yeah. and Dejan Lovren will have a role to play. Yes, we all have a role to play. That has been <laughs> your Wednesday Talking Red.